Welcome to the Rethinking Revelation podcast, where we engage the Bible and Christian tribalism at full speed like a Mack truck heading toward a deer in headlights. We are on a mission to discover and deliver the goods of God's Word to its destination, with as few pit stops as necessary and as much coffee as is humanly possible to consume. If you listen to this podcast and believe and trust what we are telling you, you might just find yourself unfriended, unfollowed, and uncompromising what are you kidding we got some awesome podcast here So grab your cup of joe and sit back and enjoy the rest of this interaction. Okay, so I heard what you were saying in terms of the post-millennial uh, preaching, you know, we're going out, we're building the kingdom, build, build, build. Right. Preterism, preterism. What I don't have in my paradigm right now, what I don't have in my in my cognitive business is that a full preterist understanding of the New Testament precludes that application of the gospel reality today. So, on the one hand, I'm you 20 years ago because I'm that's where I'm at, and I'm right. yes, yes, that's what we 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 are fully preterist because we believe that the yellow brick road was the anticipation of what Christ brings in the kingdom. And then that yellow brick road is done with. Therefore, those prophetic expectations are done with. That doesn't, in my mind, eliminate the post-millennial proclamation of the gospel for the gospel to go out and continually transform and change life and uh, promote uh, hope and expectation for uh, our glorification in the next life. Right. And that, like I said, I mean, that's that's where I was. What started the whole thing was we had, in, in that, we had this idea of an infinite, history history would actually never end in fact we called it infinite yeah. procreation when it hit me between a yeah it, it when hit when i when it came to me very 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 clearly one night reading uh gordon clark as, as anyone else and there it was and history has an end to it it must have an end to it then that that kind of started an avalanche for me. I thought, well, if history has an end, then God does know all of his people. There is a, there's not an infinite number of people. There is a number, like the Westminster Confession says, which can neither be increased nor decreased of his elect. And that's what got the ball starting. I thought, well, then history has an end. Well, then that means there's an, well, what would that be called? Well, it's called the last day. That's that's what got the chain rolling for me. It's like, oh man. Right. Right. <laughs> oh. I, I still hear. I, I got to ask a question now. Yeah. Because I ahead. think I know where you're going to go with this. Okay. All right. So again, these are just conversations which we need to have because we all love Jesus and we all love God's word and we all love the church and we actually want to respect tradition and make sense of it. So I know you're going to oppose this view. I just want you to maybe think about if you're if you're a little bit more merciful to it in this way. If what if somebody were to believe that the dead are raised 
and they're continuously raised when they die, and that there is an end, according to Scripture, and that those people in the very end of history will be raised, and then they will come down to earth and live bodily. They, that, they would say that the resurrection process is the process that we Then how would you feel about that? I mean, that's something that, again, like Ed Stevens and others, is hitting closer towards... So I'm you're open to that, and I, by any stretch of the imagination, would Don Preston would not affirm anything like that yeah. at all. I'm I'm, I'm I'm opposed to Don Preston. Right. So that to me is a better, you know, if you're open and you're still, you know, you're still, expl- then I'm fine, you know, I'm like, okay, okay, well, then, you know, let's keep talking. Yeah. So here's my pitch. So, so this is me, Sam. This is me being transparent. I feel like I don't need the New Testament at all. And I'm very, because I'm an Old Testament, uh, I guess I'm a scholar, but I study a lot of the Old Testament. I can get, I can get the end of the New Covenant out of the Old Covenant scripture. You should, you should be able to. Right. So, 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 so. Um, again, I'm not a John. I'm, I'm, I'm not an enemy of John Preston, but I don't ever endorse anything, and I don't. I think he's a writer as well. <laughs> I enjoy reading his books. Like I. But, like, I get where he's going, and I get that he says things that are seriously controversial. I'm committed to there being an end to New Covenant history. It's not eternal. It's, it's not an end to New Covenant. It's just that there, it's just an end of the history of, of, of man. It's, this is not going to go on forever. Yeah, uh, yeah. That would be to attribute something, a communicable attribute to God, which alone belongs to God eternal. That would be to communicate something to history. And the evil and the violence and the sin and, and that's that just that runs into so many theological problems I don't even want to talk about them. <laughs> so, do, 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 you, do you feel like this might this might open doors for reconciliation, presenting it in that way? <laughs> because there has to yeah be I, there, there has to be a way to communicate with both Frederick where if they're if if they're totally closed minded that's a problem and I don't support it. But if they're open minded enough to see that the Old Testament itself is clear about an end. And it's not just 70 A.D., but it's yeah. end once the kingdom comes. Do you think that's open? Do you think you're more sympathetic to those? I'm more sympathetic, yeah. Okay, all right. I mean, I, I quoted a verse, Area. which, you know, is the great Reformed verse, and I know Travis knows this well because if he's Reformed, he's heard it a billion times. I know I am the Lord. I know the beginning and the end. I am with the first generation, and I am with the last. I know all between the beginning and the end. That's in Isaiah. Classic Calvinist for it. Classic. I mean, we cite this one from here to because it means what it. Well, when I started quoting that, saying, there's, "Look, there's a beginning and there's an end." God says He's He knows from all the generations, from the first generation to the last. And then a full preterist told me, "Oh no, the first generation was the first generation of Israel, and the last generation was the last last generation of Old Covenant Israel. That's the beginning and the end of." So, and I looked at him, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. There's not a human being in the world except a full preterist that would say that. So and that's where I knew I was, I, I, like, I, there's something else going on here. Let right, me interject so let me real quick, yep. uh, because that, that wasn't where I was going to go, although it was a great, great question to bring up. Um, my my <coughs> response to what Sam said, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was almost... This is what I what I would say is I still feel like Sam that that there's no reason to throw the baby out with the bathwater people hiccup in your system, and I feel like that's where you felt like you had to go. So like when you say okay I can't go here like for me I can't deny the incarnation uh, of Christ. Oh no. Okay, but yep, that doesn't it. that doesn't mean that I'm going to throw out my full preterist persuasion. That doesn't mean that I, I, I've got to lay that aside and say now I'm no longer full preterist. So I, I'm on the same I'm on the same page as you in terms of our desire to see peace and unity. But on the one hand, I'm almost saying, Sam, come back because I don't think that you are making a reasonable you're drawing a reasonable conclusion and you're throwing the baby out. Well, I mean, for me, I'm not I, I'm not. Um, I, I'm still a preterist. I've, I've always maintained that aspect. For instance, like the incarnation of Christ, uh, especially Greek Orthodox, on the continuing incarnate body of Christ. 
when Don Preston says that he divested his flesh and he left, he, he shed his body at his, that, that alone is heresy to Greek Orthodox, to Roman Catholics, and to every conservative mainline uh, uh, catechism, confession, and creed that has ever been written. It, it goes against every aspect. But Don doesn't have a problem with it. And there's a lot of Christians saying, well, well, no, no, why does Jesus still have to be in his human body? And I just, I want to wring their neck and like, what do you, because he's a man sitting at the right hand of God. That, and if he's no longer a man with a human nature, then we're all in trouble. We're all in very much in trouble. Right. And do you think, I, I don't want to get... Do you, yeah, I think that Travis and I both agree that Jesus has a human nature, but we would say it's glorified. Where do you stand on that? I say he's glorified, yes. And I agree with the Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox that he was glorified at his resurrection. That's when he was glorified, because that's what Paul says, that resurrection, the, it's yeah, thrown in corruption, it's raised in glory. He wasn't raised in non-glory and then waited 40 days and then was transformed into glory. I mean, as I was saying, these, are, these have become sort of core, like the millennium, that's not 30 years. There's no way around this. I, I won't. I don't even listen to someone that tries to, to say it. it's, it's because it's, it's, but you, you can't it find a, a, but you, but you do take it as symbolic of the rain. Oh yeah, it's definitely symbolic. This is a, was the cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, there's more than a thousand hills. So a thousand can always be expanded upon, but can, it never in scripture is reduced. Never. Well, not, so, nowhere. Again, I, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to make you not believe your commitment. But do you mind if I say uh, a thought about that? Right. About the shrinking. So here's here's what I have to say about that. There are rabbis after 70 A.D. who didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and in those debates, they they debate about the messianic reign. So when he comes, and he comes to bring the end, they they guess and they came up with a number of years. Of course, they they understood it literally, but they said, okay, this. There's going to be a period of the reign of Christ to bring about the end, and it's going to be, these are real, real numbers that they write about, 40 years, 160 years, and 1,000. So those are, these are numbers they all talk about in the same letter as, as the reign of Christ to bring about the end. I do think that there is there's room in rabbinical tradition. It's only rabbinical, it's not Christian. There's room in rabbinical tradition where if, they, if the Jews would have viewed the Messianic reign to bring about the end as symbolic of that reign to bring about the end, the, the mistaken part could be the literalness instead of the symbolism. So at that point, again, we're, we're, I'm arguing against Christian tradition if I were to go that route, but I'm saying that at least in Jewish tradition, the symbolism is not of so much the literal years, but as much as what the years represent, the reign of Christ to bring about the end. So you're still under the old covenant. Like, they don't, they don't accept the new covenant. So. If I, and I understand that. If, if I follow Barker, um, where in her chapter on the, her commentary on Revelation, she, she actually states that the thousand years was pretty much a predominant. And then it wasn't until after um, the spread of the church that they started kind of truncating, truncating these the views among the among the Jews. But prior to that, it was a it was a thousand years. It was a long time. Some even had it longer than that. And uh, Margaret Barker, um, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, her commentary on Revelation, which is a which is an interesting, quite an interesting read. She is a wild and She's all over the place. But she's, you know, along the road there, you see a lot of interesting little things that she does pick up on. And yeah, yeah, yeah. A Thousand Years is one of them where she says this is a... Uh, and she she does what I think Second Peter and Shepherd of Hermas and the Apostle John is. So this, this is an extension of time. It's a revelation of a thousand years. All these things were expected. All these things were at hand. All these things are ready. Jesus is holding the keys of death and life in his hands. He's not swallowed them up, but he's holding them in his hands. Everything is set. The, the, the thrones have been set. The books are opened. Everything is ready to go. The end is right at, over your head. Here's a thousand years. So, and okay. that's it. So let me ask you this, then. Do you, do you then think that Christ can come back at any moment? Oh, yes. 
Okay. Now there's nothing there's nothing preventing him. He's he's ready to judge the living and the dead. There's nothing preventing him. Nothing. So you think so you think the tri- the the tribulation would be a preterist event? Well, if you look at the word sleepsis or tribulation, it's the uh, Israel suffered many tribulations throughout the Old Testament. That word's yeah, used yeah, a lot. That's, yeah, that's a, and that's even great tribulation. I mean, Nineveh went through a great tribulation. In yeah, Na- in about, in Nahum. Right, right. Well, we're not talking about Nineveh. We're so about was that the tribulation to end all tribulations? No. Uh, World War II brings to mind a great yeah. tribulation. Yeah. Right, but the right that's not because of the historical context of what Jesus is talking about. The tribulation is the Judaizing apostate putting to death the Messiah and then pursuing his bride and killing her. That, that, that certainly was a, a, that was a tribulation, there's no doubt about it. It wasn't a tribulation to end all tribulations, so, though. Right. So. The, the, there is no allowance to dehistoricize and transhistoricize the tribulation, the tribulation that Jesus was talking about came upon that generation. There is no other the tribulation. There is no tribulation today because the Jews are not persecuting the church and killing her. It cannot be transhistoricized. And so the other thing that I want to bring back, to go back to what you said about the Thousand Hills, I... I'm not comfortable with the universal negative that, that you're purporting that a thousand years cannot represent something smaller because a symbol is a symbol. And, it, and we, we, I don't think, right? I don't know that I have a satisfactory answer for what a thousand years are, but I'm going to tell you when they happened in the first century. Whatever it was, it happened in the first century. But I don't, I, I'd like you to think about the universal negative that you're pushing out there. It cannot, in no way. I don't think that we can die on that hill. Okay. So for, I mean, so for instance, at least reasonable. Let, for, for instance, let me just throw out a complete hypothetical. Sam, are you still there? Sam, yeah, are you I still he, there? I thought he dropped off. But like he said last time, he could still hear us. So maybe I'll just keep talking. Maybe um, he'll come back. Maybe yeah, he'll come know. back. It was the rapture. We missed it. Um, no, like, I, I think it's respectful for him to say... Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay. Hey, you're back. Jeez. You're resurrected from the... Let me let me say something on the the thousand years because we find the symbol many times in the in the Old Testament. So let me, let me rather than being circular, I would want to find an example where a thousand years has actually shrunk. Let me, let me and let me, rather than Revelation twenty, you can't use that one. Yeah. Show me other examples where there's precedent. I just want to finish my thought, and then and then you can bring up yours if you like. Yeah, my, my I have point, an answer to that. Second point was, for instance, let me just say for instance. Let's say you and I were out in we're, we're uh, out in the in the wilderness. We look to the hills, and there are not a thousand of them in front of us. But I say the Lord is the Lord of a thousand hills. Yep. Now there are less than a thousand. But no, I, there's not. Okay, Sam. Sam. In in, in sight, he's saying. I'm he's saying, saying he's in saying our sight. Yeah. I, I would know that immediately by what you're saying that you're not referring to every hill that I'm looking at. That's my just just by that. just by the example that you're using, I would okay. I would know that you're using hyperbole. Okay. Right, right, right. Wait, so Travis, I know what you're saying, and Sam, I know what you're saying, but if you're putting yourselves in the shoe, all Travis is saying is that his eyes, looking around, there's no location where he can see one thousand of them, and yet if he made the statement, that implies that it is hyperbole, that it makes exceptions for what is visibly less. That's all he's saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that there's more. Of the, I know there's more hills than what I'm looking at. Right, no, and, and, there's, and there's and there's less than I am looking at. Yeah. Oh yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all. Okay. He keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. You know, that's not what what that means is he keeps his 
covenant eternally. He, he, he keeps his covenant. Just a thousand, I mean, they didn't have a word for a million in Hebrew, so it's just, you know, a thousand becomes this kind of word that's thrown out there, that ten times ten times ten. It's a magnificence. So, and, and it's never shrunk. And I would have to see an example where it's shrunk. And there isn't any. And to use such a grandiose symbol for 37 years, to me, is just begging the question. It's not it's right. not shrinking, Sam. It's just what we're trying to say is, again, a symbol is a symbol. It, it By nature, it's not literal. It can be large. It can be small. I'm saying it can be large or it can be small. We cannot necessarily eliminate one or the other per se. So... So here, so here's my response. I don't know how familiar you are with rabbinic tradition. I'm, I'm only vaguely familiar with it, but I focused my study on the millennium. And what I have found out is that the rabbis, when they came up with the reign of the Messiah when he came, and they came up with the number of 40 years, 360, 1,000. Can you all hear me, by the way? Yep. Sam, can you hear me? Just keep talking. He'll come back. All right. So maybe you can hear me. So what I found in my studies is that the rabbis took literally the thousand generations to Israel, the, the language of God's faithfulness to a thousand generations to Israel. And I noticed that there were not 1,000 generations of Israel before Israel ended. So by implication, the 1,000 is up less than what is literal, 1,000. Okay, That's so let me try to restate what you're saying. You're saying that yeah. in their... In their ideology, they're saying that this is talking about Israel's generation. Like you're saying about this. You're breaking up. I can't hear what you're saying. I can't hear anything now. I can't hear anything, but we're still on the phone. Can oh. you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Did you hear what I said? No, because you, I, I didn't I just, hear anything. Oh, I just tried to clarify that I understood what you were saying. But yeah, because so again, yeah, and I'll just repeat myself. So the, the, they know that the Lord promised His faithfulness to a thousand generations, and they interpret it to Israel. And that's because it clearly seems to be attributed to Israel in the statements that they're made, and they're made numerous yeah. times. Yeah. So we know that there were not literally one thousand generations of Israel. There still have not been. 1,000 generations of Israel to this day. So, uh, in light of that, um, that that's, that's an implicit example, at least, if we're just going to accommodate the 1,000 years being symbolic of a time that's less than 1,000 right. literal years, that's at least an obvious statement where it's not, it's not beyond what God actually provided historically. It's actually much less than. Israel didn't last 1,000 generations. On how you define Israel? Oh, I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you with the. With the I'm not. I'm not even a supersessionist, but I, I. I get the language. I think that the church is the new Israel. But it, yeah. it's still interesting. It's still interesting as far as dialogue though. Rabbinical commentaries um, have arisen within the last 50 years to literally take the place of New Testament studies. There's this whole branch called Second Temple Judaism and early Christianity. And Second Temple Judaism has this language that's tied to the 70 AD yeah. Judaism. And I find it interesting that the literal thousand years ends up being uh, a mistake on the sense of rabbis because they reject Jesus as the Messiah bringing in his reign. But they still take the promise to a thousand generations. But we know that if Jesus was true, that the thousand generations of literal ethnic Israel ended way less than a thousand generations. Well, I mean, there you're bringing in, you know, the Talmud or Mishnah or whatever you're getting that from into the discussion of Revelation 20. Um, and I, I don't think, oh, it's very, well, number one, Mishnah was not until 200 CE. So it, no, no, no. I, I'm saying why is that any different than bringing in Second Temple information to help us understand the new well, we, it does help us understand, but it's it's not the end all be all because, like you said, he has forty, he has three sixty, he has yeah, seven hundred. There's eight hundred. I've seen nine hundred. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah, seen yeah. one rabbi who is equating it to the time that the day of the Lord 
was was Adam's day and that Adam died in the day of the Lord because the day is a thousand years and Adam lived only to 930 years. So we can go down that route all day long. Yeah, well, again, 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 I, I agree with the ambiguity of interpret it, but, I, but I'm at least, so my only reason for, for, for opening up even rabbinical discussions is, is so that Christians can treat other Christians and with with there being a more fundamental unity than the eschatological hills we die on, they're like I I I don't agree with the with the Don Preston full preterism. So like I'm with you on that stance. But right. since I'm with I'm with Travis in opening up the discussion where how can we how can we bridge this where these full preterists like Travis are not they're not treated like Don Preston, uh, but they're also um, they're not Aryans, if you know what I mean. But, and and I, that, that's why I really want to facilitate the discussion, because I'm within the Angel King Communion, and I get it. And I, and I interact with Catholics and Orthodox on a weekly basis during their PhDs. And, and I, I really respect the openness to um, Christian tradition, how they've thought through um, previous commitments, and then they've changed their mind based on new historical insights. And it doesn't do away with the creeds. It just means that, like, we need to be willing to treat each other as Christians, knowing that the church has said one thing and we say another. That's very different than the John Prestons of the world to try to create a whole new church. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not in, I'm, I'm not in favor of that. I don't, because of, and this gets into other doctrines where, Again, you know, Jesus Christ didn't shed his body at the ascension. His body was glorified, and he, what theologians, Charles Hodge, or whoever you would tell, I mean, whoever you read, it doesn't make any, you know, Greek Orthodox, that Jesus, the human being, Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, is local and spatial. The human being yeah. is. He's yeah. local and he's spatial. Well, he must remain in heaven. Okay, so I can't see Jesus. I don't, I've never seen him. I've never seen him in my. I've never touched him. I've never seen him. Now, the logos, the spirit of God, and here we get into Trinitarianism. Yep. Because of Christ, who is omnipotent, but the man Christ Jesus is not omnipotent. There's incommunicable attributes of God that are not given to the man Christ Jesus, nor are they given to him in his exaltation in heaven. So, that being the case, Jesus, the man Christ Jesus did not come to earth in A.D. 70. If he did, he would have been seen, and he wasn't. Well, yeah, who thinks that he did come to earth bodily? The full preterists do. Oh, see, I don't agree with that. that yeah. That, that, or, or they go the other route and say that he no longer is in his human body. See, they got to get around that because they have to have all prophecy fulfilled in A.D. 70, so they've got, they have to attack the continuing incarnate body of the Lord or as I did in one lecture against Don Preston, you got to get rid of the body. You have to. Yeah. Because if Jesus was raised in his body and his human body was glorified, then that defines what resurrection is. That yeah. That is the very definition yeah. of it. Do you ever feel that you got caught up in a movement and you, you helped popularize a movement that, that, um, that, I mean, it's obviously problematic, but, like, that there's now a growing interest in how to – how to rethink full preterism, where they're not at all fitting into that. Um, and there's many that are coming out. They're beginning to relook. And I said, that's all I'm asking you to do is look at this all prophecy was fulfilled yeah. in 8070, because that just, yeah. that does not work. It, it, well, prophecy, well, number one, is a messy thing. It just, I'm, I'm very much involved in Jeremiah, uh, going through, trans, just really heavily reading Jeremiah, and over and over and over and over again. There are contingencies involved. What it, what it appears in Jeremiah is that Jeremiah, after 70 years, is going to do a new thing on earth. A new covenant is going to be made. The branch is going to come. All nations will be healed. Israel will never again be uprooted from her home. This, these are the promises of Jeremiah after the 70 years. Does that happen? No, it does not. Then we get Daniel. Daniel sees these visions that go on in the temple under Antiochus IV as fact and all these horrible things. Does all of it come to light? No, it does not. What's going on here? 
what, 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 God, where are you? What are you doing? How long are you going to wait? And this goes on and on. And this is where most scholars are at now, that when you take away the tension of eschatology, you've taken away New Testament eschatology. There is tension there. There's supposed to be tension there. It's a crisis. And there's supposed to be crisis there. It's your faith in God is being tested. Are you going to maintain? And are you going to stick through? Are you going to maintain your faith? Or are you going to figure it all out and it was all solved in AD 70? That's not an answer. That's yeah. not an answer. For a full preterist John Preston King kind of group, I totally uh, empathize with you, and I'm in agreement. Because I, I want to have empathy with pain and, and suffering. I, I want to have empathy with people that I work with that are suffering and they're in pain, and I don't want to tell them, hey, everything's great. I need you to, I need you to stop. I'm yeah. going to step on your toes a little bit there, Sam, because... What you're saying is a non sequitur. That does not follow that we have no recourse to do what you're saying. Jonathan and I are going to say, you can do that. You can. Oh, I hear you guys. Yeah, you guys are doing that. But I'm saying full preterists in general don't do that. They don't, they have, they don't have a recourse. They've, they have, they've cut off any recourse. You guys have it, and that's fantastic. Right. But listen, what I'm saying, though, is, is that... Don't bring it up then. If Jonathan no, and I, no, 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 I, I don't, I know, I know. I'm being a little bit, but, but my point is, is that we, we don't, we want to, we don't want to go down rabbit trails that we don't need to go down. So that issue for us. So the talk, you know, talking about suffering and all that kind of stuff, we're going to affirm that and be good with that. I, in my interactions with some of the reformed guys that I've had on my podcast who have written books on. Um, post-millennialism and things, um, my, my one response is that if you are going to maintain that aspect of prophecy, then you have no guarantee that history is going to end because something else in the future can always come up again that's going to be a hiccup. Well, no, there I, I have it with what we call there's the hidden counsel of God, which will always stand firm. There are things known in the hidden counsel of God, which will always stand firm. And then there's, from the standpoint of man, there's contingency. These contingencies are not forever, and neither are they ever given any attributes of being forever. There's the hidden purpose of God. I can say that because I do not know the times and the seasons the Father has set. There are set times and seasons. I don't know them. I don't know the yeah. contingencies of them, but they are going to happen. Yeah, so, Travis, I agree with Sam on this regard. There's, there's mystery. See, there's mystery yeah. there. Where's yeah, the mystery? But, <laughs> yeah, but, again, I want to go back to unity because I'm thankful that you see that Travis and I are not not in the Don Preston camp. I don't see you guys there, no. No. Um, so, but what, what we what we what we want to do? We want an open conversation. We'll, we're full preterists of the John Preston camp can rethink Revelation, and we feel like that's impossible without engaging with Christians that are not full preterists. Well, we 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 brought on scholars on the podcast. One from Jerusalem, who deal, who's written his PhD thesis on uh, um, uh, Adam as Israel. Israel as Adam as a reduction to the tonic. We brought on temple scholars. We brought on ancient Near Eastern scholars. We've talked about a lot of things. And we're not at all saying, like, oh, well, we have them on the show in order to endorse everything they believe. We, we, we feel like there's enough, there are enough discoveries to rethink Revelation where, where there can be an exodus of sorts out of the Don Preston groups but still not be treated like Aryans because they want to believe in fulfilled prophecy. Travis, so Travis is wrestling with, and I wrestle with this too, so I'll speak for myself. I wrestle with being treated by pastors uh, as an Aryan when all I want to do is talk about the Bible and the tradition. And I'm not, I'm not ignorant of the tradition. Um, and, and like, I feel like, I feel like I get blacklisted and blackballed, like, like I'm an Aryan and I need to repent when I really think to myself, man, like, I just want to be shepherded through this. Like, walk me through this rationally. <laughs> We've tried to break down the, the basic elements of what I would refer to as, as biblical eschatology. Uh, there, there is a finality to history. Um, I agree that, with you. I, there's I, no, I if you surrender that one, then you're open up into all kinds of 
there is going to be a new heavens and a new earth. There's there's going to be that a restoration. Right, I don't know what that is. What that don't ask me the scientific definitions and what kind of molecules are going to change into. Mo- I, I don't. That's ridiculous. Paul does not engage. When people say, "Well, you believe in resurrection of the dead," and I said, "Yeah, well, you mean physical bodies are going to?" Well, not so fast. Paul talks about a spiritual body. There's continuity. There's discontinuity. These are theological terms. It's self same body. There's form. There's identity. There's those kinds of things. Is it is it something out of the Walking Dead, out of the George Romero movie? No, that's not Resurrection of the Dead. No. It's really interesting because if you talk with Catholic scholars, and I talked to them here at Marquette University, I was talking to one tonight at a birthday party for my son, and this is a guy who's written books on the intersection between Aquinas and um, Palama. He's an Eastern Orthodox professor, and he he's really he's published lots of academic books. But like when we talk about the um, the new heavens and the new earth and the recreation of all things, what came up was the resurrection of the dead. And mm-hmm. he actually said, well, you know, in the tradition, that's very open. Like, you're not saying, we're not saying that, like, the ashes in the grave are what are exactly come back to life. We're oh, no. The they're saying that the substance of it is somehow connected with the glory. Exactly. Of, uh, exactly. Of but what's yeah. interesting is that Travis and I have both been blacklisted from a reformed conversation on this discussion because they insist that that the Christian tradition says otherwise. Oh, no. Uh, you can't read John Calvin, where, where Calvin talks about the subsistence. Um, uh, today we would use the term DNA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how much how much needs to be there? It's just so... Continuity just I mean, it all comes out of the Reformed tradition, so I would say that these Reformed guys, they don't, you know. Now, is there, well, if there's new heavens and new earth, then there's disappearance of all old things, you know, skeletons, and all, that'll all be gone. As to what that is in terms of substance, there's a continuity of substance, form, and identity with my earthly body transformed. Yeah. Yeah, as so it should be in the mind of God. Yeah, and what's so interesting is that we've gotten to the point in Christian tradition where we're so divided that we can't talk about how this fits with the Bible anymore. Some one one tribe says one thing, another tribe says another. It really, shouldn't be a Don Preston tribe versus Christianity, and that's what's opposed to that. I mean, Preston sticks out because he's the most voluminous full preter preterist author to date. I mean, he, he's, oh, yeah. he's the most one, he's the biggest one that's out there right now. He's far, as far as I'm concerned, he inherited from Max King and continued on. And I watched his ministry. He left his, he, when I was with him, he left his pastor and he went on and to start his full time ministry doing this. So, you know, he cranks out a couple of books every year and he's been doing that for 10, 12 years. So. Yeah. He's built kind of a full preterist empire for himself. He is the go-to guy. It's yeah, unfortunate uh, that there are not yeah. other voices out there um, that are competing and, and, and taking on Don Preston, but everyone seems to be afraid to take on Don Preston. And I'm like, I, I know, I'm, this I'm guy is not off limits. You know, yeah, there's no, I'm, you know. Yeah, I'm very vocal on this podcast that I don't endorse the man, and I'm not in that camp. Several critical mistakes that Preston that Preston makes. Very critical mistakes. Well, what's so interesting is that like you've come out of this. Do you suspect that that okay? I mean, you know that you don't know everything, and that's a humble. Oh yeah, no. Man. <laughs> and uh, you, exactly, like that's a that's a yeah, still searching. And but like because of your openness, I feel like we have an advocate with you where we can say, okay, we're brothers in Christ. Uh, we're we're both possibly talking past each other in places, but we're, we're we're neither of us are in the Don Preston camp. Neither of us. Not, we all we all want to take the integrity of the Bible seriously. We want to talk about hermeneutics. Mm-hmm. We want to talk about how how we do not divide the church that exists. We don't want to create a full preterist tribe. That's not what we're about. <laughs> That's totally and that's, not, like, re- rethinking revelation is right. we're about actually rethinking it so that it's almost like it's almost like every tradition Catholic Orthodox uh, Protestant can can just sit back and think okay is there merit to what we're saying because Travis and this John guy are willing to talk about stuff that if if like like not even Don Preston's willing to consider right 
Yeah, you're outside the bounds. I mean, I don't consider you "quote unquote" full preterist. I don't even like the term. I, I mean, the, like tra- I like Travis's term where we're Olivetianists. We think that the Olivet Discourse has significant ramifications, understanding the New Testament. <laughs> I mean, we would encounter people. The first thing, I mean, it, look, I you know, I work at a hardware store. So I'm I'm seeing, and I was a contractor janitorial. I owned a janitorial business, you know, for 11 years. So I, I'm my dad is blue collar, retired Chrysler factory. I so that these are my people, blue collar. That's you know, I, these are my guys. I'm blue, I'm blue collar. And I'm an electrical contractor. when you start talking to them about resurrection of the dead, they know what you mean. They know what that means. When you start talking about them wars and rumors of wars, they know what that. And if you said, well, that ended in eighty seventy, they just look at you with a blank stare. It's like, well, uh, what do you do? I, I fought World War II. You want to tell me wars and rumors of wars? That, you want to tell me that? Yeah, but do you think there's a difference between um, uh, Jesus and the apostles recording events and then the reign of Christ and his church being like fulfilling antitypes in history of Israel's life and history? There's a lot that plays around with that. We were working with typology, for example. Um, you have Moses, and Moses, of course, cannot go into the land of promise, right? Uh, Jesus actually leads them in Joshua, which is just Jesus. That's another, it's his name, Jesus. <laughs> so Jesus succeeds yeah. Moses. Jesus leads them into the promised land. First city he conquers, Jericho. Sounds very familiar to the destruction of Jerusalem with the seven trumpets sounding, and then they surround it, and then the walls come down. But that was just the first city. There were other cities to conquer. And it finally comes into where you have King David, and then the son of David. The son of David builds the temple, erects it, and it says, and there was peace on all sides, and all the nations came, and there you go. That hasn't happened yet. So we were trying to say, as a full, we were like, okay, Moses ended. There's the old covenant. Moses could not go into the land of promise. There's the kingdom of God. Jesus brings us into the kingdom of God, and what does he do? He begins to conquer city by city by city by nation by nation by nation until the church has peace on all sides. I'm with you. That's the typology. So I asked Paul Preterus, where's the son, where's, where's the, son of the, the son of David at? If Jesus is the type, where's the antitype son of David? Because he is the seed of David. I'm with you. He doesn't stop being the seed of David. He is the seed of David. Yep, and these are great. I think these are important questions to aim to hear. Because, like, it, it's almost like we're pitted against each other, and it's like full preterists like Don Presser, and they're comfortable with that, as though, like, they're a church. And I have a huge problem with that, because I, I know my Protestant and my Catholic and my Orthodox brothers and sisters are real brothers and sisters. We're going to be in heaven laughing about how wrong we were about a bunch of things. No, no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, that it, it struck me like you brought up Revelation uh, five, and it sees they see the Lamb of God as one slain, and one of the cases, the line of the of Jesus ascended. He's in heaven, the one is slain, and so he's he's raised from the dead, and he's in heaven. And the angels refer to him and call him the root of David. He now he wasn't the root of David. He is the root of David. That didn't stop. When he was glorified and remained in heaven, the root of David didn't sp- – he is, today as we speak, he is the root of David. Well, i got to do something with that because that didn't stop in eighty seventy. He still is the root of David. Amen. And yeah. i got to deal with that. You know, i got to deal with the fact that, amazingly, I am still talking about Israel in the headlines and the city of Jerusalem today. I'm not talking about Amalekites. We're not talking about Assyrians. We're not talking about Hittites, except in archaeological discoveries. But we still, present tense, are talking about Israel and Jerusalem. I, I don't know what that means. I just find it amazing. Yeah. So, so, so this might, you know, even if this is an area of disagreement between Travis and I and you, and even if neither of us agree with each other, I'm curious what your thoughts are of about Israel. Yeah. yeah I'm still here. Okay. I bought a, I found a book by Emil um, Falkenheim, who's a Jewish uh, philosopher, and, he's, and his book is The Jewish Return into History. And in that, he says an interesting relationship between Jews and Christians. If it wasn't for the rejection of the Christian Messiah, there would be no Christianity. So without Israel, there would be no Christianity. 
But in the turn of history, without Christianity, there would be no Israel. Okay. And I thought, wow. Um, let's see here. So through the demise of Israel, Christianity was born. And in turn, because of the salvation of Christianity, Israel is in existence. And it sounded familiar. I was like, here's the prophecy. The nations will carry you on their arms. The nations will flock around one Jew. A thousand will flock around one Jew and will carry you on their arms. And I'm like, it, there is a relationship between Judaism and Christianity that we have ignored for a long, long, long time. And, yeah, and you, I'm an ecumenicist. I'm very strong in ecumenical dialogue. And even with Muslims, devout, sincere Muslims, not the nut jobs and the crazy the crazy nut job people, the actual yeah, sincere yeah. Muslims whose God is the God of Abraham. I'm interested in talking to that guy because I, I would rather talk to a guy like that than a secular atheist out here running around with flags and protesting <laughs> racism all over. I, that guy's lost as far as I'm yeah. concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm totally on board with you. I think yeah. we, our two hearts are alike in that regard. Do you have a, do you have a, um, like a hermeneutical block where you where you say like for this reason I don't believe the temple must be rebuilt. I, I'm I don't I'm in I'm indifferent to that. Um, because would you see it as I don't have any real thoughts on any of that. Would you would you would you kind of like have this lingering suspicion that if it is rebuilt it's going to be a sign of judgment for trying to raise up a I if it, if there's a temple rebuilt on the mount where it's I would find that incredible. <laughs> I'm with you. Be yeah. Because the odds, the odds are. But again, you look at 1967; the odds were overwhelmingly against Jerusalem being reclaimed as an Israelite capital. That was, the odds were overwhelming. And here they are today, right? And they and they won it in seven days. Yeah. I'm I, I, I'm I, I I I don't know what to do with that. I don't want to. I'm I'm with you. I wouldn't link it to prophecy, but I would too find it remarkable. Isn't, isn't, it, isn't it interesting how like thinking about your past, what you were in, what you what you invested in, what you came out of, how that makes you more open to the body of Christ and and to what the, the Spirit of God is doing in lives. I'm definitely more open today than I was ten fifteen years ago. Yeah. It, and praise God for it. It's not like you're like uh, you're not destroying Christianity or the Church of the Kingdom of God by doing that. You're actually like you're actually opening up opportunities to love your neighbor because of that belief, right? Yeah, it, it opens up. I mean, you try to read between the lines and understanding uh, when people talk about Jesus and they talk, you know, um, you just I, I'm more accepting. Like if, if you're talking about Jesus, then I want to talk to you. I'm, you know, amen. then now let's, yeah, yeah. You know, who is Jesus? Who do you say that he is? And then they start, well, he was the third galaxy that was revealed to me from the angel. <laughs> then I start losing. I'm like, okay, we're talking about two different Jesuses here. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, that's, a that's a different trajectory. For that's where I get, that's where I'm creedal. And they'll say, well, who, do, you know, well, how can Jesus be God and man? Say, well, let me, let me, let me talk, let me walk you down the line here question was asked in the first century. How can God become man? This podcast has gone really long. I'd love to actually like have you back on to talk more about other issues. Like I'd love to talk to you about your views of death itself. But now is that because uh, um great, awesome. Travis, do you have any more questions? Do you have any more challenges? No, it it'll, it'll 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 keep the podcast going too long. We can we can do that later on. I mean I, I do think that there are exegetical things that it would be helpful for us to discuss. But um, you know, I, I think we're we're probably taxing the uh, time limit in terms of. Thanks, Sam. I, this has yeah. been great because I I'm so I, I'm I'm going to be in prayer tonight, just thankful to our Lord and Savior that this has been this has been a better conversation than the last one I heard on the podcast between the two of you. <laughs> yeah, we were in the Genesis and all that stuff. You keep Travis and away from Genesis, and we'll be. <laughs> All right, there you have it. That wraps up our 77th episode, our second interview with Sam Frost. I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure that you visit us at RethinkingRevelation.com, Facebook Rethinking Revelation, and then also on Twitter, 
Make sure you like us on iTunes and give us a great review, and we hope to hear from you. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you're asking. Let us know what you're challenging. All right. Until next time. Thank you.